lucky to be blessed with the true brave souls that do speak out yeah, the truth. Yeah. Okay, so it's good. Uh, what is that? And our next speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Mike. Not sure I'm going to try his last name because I'm afraid I'll murder it. But um, he has extensive experience as an ear, nose, throat physician working along with Gulf Coast and with the repercussions of the meat peoples and the community there. So um, I invite you to listen and learn from his expertise. Welcome. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I've been sitting back there and listening to the speakers, and uh, I enjoyed David's talk. I'm not sure that I enjoyed very much the talk of the previous speaker, because I had a great deal of disagreement with him uh, and what I've seen, what I've done, and what I've learned the last few years. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but uh, my wife was uh, was an Indian chief. She was the principal chief of the largest Native American tribe in the state when the oil spill occurred. And most of her constituents, most of her tribal people were people that worked in the oil field and were fishing. Her father was a lifelong fisherman and so forth. And with the advent of the spill, we were really curious about the health of the people that were involved with it. Because right after the spill, we had there was some news articles that showed that a lot of people went to the hospital and were, were checked for this. And we asked and asked and asked to most of our family members, okay, because the tribe is one big family, 17,000 member family. And uh, we didn't really find very much. And then I got a call from a woman by the name of Mary Lee Orr. Mary Lee Orr is the executive director of the largest environmental group in the state. And Mary asked me if I'd draw some VOCs on, uh, uh, on the number of, uh, of patients she had that she was convinced were ill from the spill. And so that began my, my spending the last over three years, day in and day out, working on this issue. I learned a lot, and it reinforced a lot of what I knew already. Um, we were talking about the number of barrels of oil that was spilled, and if you noticed, uh, Dr. Mason uh, had 5,000 barrels, and then the first presenter had 250,000 barrels, and then uh, Mr. Lincoln had a different number of barrels, and uh, nobody seems to be able to, to determine what was happening over there. Well, spilled in my environment, the environment I grew up in, were five million barrels of oil, okay? We had five million barrels of oil that were spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and there was approximately two million barrels, I mean two million gallons of dispersant used. Now we learned since the spill that this dispersant uh, is highly toxic in and of itself, but nobody, it's a proprietary thing, so nobody really knows what's in it. And um, I, I think they do know what's in it now. But um, it is still legal to use, in spite of the fact that it caused an untold amount of misery and health-related issues in our community. This was the largest oil spill reported worldwide in history. Uh, and just recently, they found a 40,000-pound oil mat in the, right in the middle of one of our okay. most, pro, uh, the most uh, productive estuary complexes okay. in the world, which is where I live, in, uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, right next to the Gulf in a, uh, in a small town uh, that's, well, you know, you don't live right next to it, but pretty close to the Gulf of Mexico. It's where I, I, was, I grew up on this, uh, on the coastal area and in, the, in that environment. Um, I initially met with about a dozen people at my office in Mason's and I began going blood for the first time in 40 years or so. And uh, we, um, there was a young child from Pensacola that had been in Pensacola and had gotten extremely ill. Came home and was, um, I had to go here to the hospital and didn't know what the hell he had. Sick as a dog, uh, thought it was a renal disorder they operated on. And uh, eventually his father, I understand Baton Rouge is the center of Exxon. Exxon has a huge refinery in Baton Rouge. 
And uh, before they asked the, uh, uh, the doctor, he said, uh, is it possible that, uh, that my son got sick from being in the water in Pensacola? What I didn't tell you about the story was that the child was swimming in a swimming pool adjacent to the Gulf when they were cleaning booms on the beach where he was swimming in the school. And uh, when he asked the doctor this, the physician immediately got uh, very defensive and so forth. And the next day, the child was discharged from the hospital. Okay? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he is doing reasonably well with the father's who are sick about any potential problems for the future. Uh, this was another child, another three-year-old, uh, who had splotches on her skin. And uh, that was, these pictures were taken when she was in the home office at that time, and um, uh, she and her sister were both extremely ill, as were her mother and father, with various and sundry symptoms that we're going to get to in a moment. Um, as, as, as after the initial phase of me seeing these people in the office, by the way, one young man was, uh, uh, was uh, having seizures, I think I'll get to this in a minute, but what I later saw was that people from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, all have identical symptoms, identical problems. And I suspect that you guys are going to have identical problems too from, from the exposures that you had. And when I get into this later on, you may be able to see some of these things. And I'll have some of this available for you, some of these symptoms that you can learn about from uh, on the website that I'll give to you. Um, I'm a voracious reader, and uh, I read five or six newspapers a day. I cut out clippings, I scan, I put them in the computer, and so forth. I've been overwhelmed lately and haven't been able to keep up with it. But for the spill, rather than just cutting out the clippings, I took and I laminated the entire articles. Uh, and uh, I can show you an all, about 50 pounds of laminated paper where there's articles on fish, shrimp, ducks, pelicans, uh, porpoises, what have you, name it. But you're not going to find a single article on human health problems. Not a single article. They have managed to suppress the illnesses that people have been suffering from that well. Uh, the Huffington Post and, uh, of all things, Al Jazeera covered this very well. And they were the only publications that covered it to any significant degree. And this wasn't my first rodeo. I had been in the uh, state senate fighting the oil and gas industry uh, when they had delivered a, I had a small Native American community called Grand Bois, Louisiana, uh, where they had been delivering toxic materials from uh, Scambia, Alabama. And they had brought in this material that was so toxic, it was like this heavy crude that you're talking about, that they had a convoy of trucks, and the back trucks, the drivers were getting so sick that they played leapfrog all the way to Goldwater, Louisiana, and that the back trucks would pass the front trucks up because the guys in the back were getting sick. When they got to, when they got to Grandbois and started emptying this, uh, these tr this trucks into the pit. They have what we call a landform. As, uh, they allow you to take oil field waste and put it in open pits, and then they, they put some chemicals in it and they agitate it with a, uh, with a backhoe with a propeller on it and so forth, and, and they do this type of things. Well, they were dumping this in the pit. The pit was illegally close to a, a residence, just 300 feet, less than 300 feet from a residence, where a little girl, and that's the story I'm not going to tell you to was extremely, extremely ill, and people were falling out from this. They had a, a, a reporter who was out there who actually passed out and had to be rushed to the hospital. And all the community members were, everyone was overwhelmed by this. I was later to learn that there was nothing illegal about what they were doing, okay? And I'll explain to you what, what that is involved with. Um, so uh, this is the 23, I think, page report that I wrote on this. Uh, for the, um, the Senate Committee on, uh, on Raw Fuel Waste. And um, it was, uh, I'm sure nobody in the industry or anywhere else has read, read the damn thing. But it was done in 1998. So I've been around this for a while. This was such an interesting story that 60 Minutes came down and did 60 Minutes. I've never seen 60 Minutes do a 60 Minutes segment. But 60 Minutes did a 60 Minutes segment on this issue. And uh, I'm going to play for you a uh, few minutes of that uh, of that program because it's got some information on it that's going to make your hair stand on end a little bit. I'll tell you why a lot of what went in your yards and your homes is not regulated by OSHA and it may not even be illegal for them to have done. Oops.
going to lose all of a couple of very, very nice films that I have over here. But anyway, during the course of this, uh, this presentation, uh, Carol Brown, who was the, uh, uh, was the head of the Environmental Protection Agency at the time, describes how the Environmental Protection Agency, which in 1972, I think, was given the mandate that they were going to regulate the handling, transportation, and storage of hazardous materials, and all the gas industry immediately got an exemption promising that they were going to do a study. In 1976, in the Reagan administration, the study was performed, and the study showed that there was no problems with oil and gas uh, materials being hazardous. And so they created a new category of waste called NOW, non-hazardous oil field waste. And basically what the law said that anything that was a result of exploration and production of petroleum products was non-hazardous by definition. Okay, it was NOW. Well, uh, Carl Brown explains during this program that not only was this stuff uh, uh, hazardous, it was highly hazardous, and it was not regulated by the EPA. They lied on the study that was done. The lady who actually did the study, a woman by the name of Carla Greathouse, actually made a presentation, and she described how the, um, um, how the, uh, the scientists had come up with a conclusion that several parts of the oil fuel waste stream, the 16 different parts of the oil fuel waste stream, which I know from having a lot of papers on it, and four of the, uh, the components of the stream are highly toxic. And, uh, and so the, uh, she said the report came out, they got to the political side of this, Congress changed the report, they passed the law. So we're gonna see in a few minutes where, um, in spite of all of this, uh, and I'll, I'll, we'll see how, how this plays out in the real life situation that I've actually lived through. So, um, and here's the, the disappearing report. Uh, and uh, here's the um, here's the report that was that I've, I printed out years ago and, uh, and bound and so forth. And uh, the report that says there's no problem with this stuff when actually everyone knows that it's highly toxic. Okay, and here's a booklet. The EPA was stuck because uh, I'm sure the scientists and, and the people that worked at the EPA were not happy with the with the fact that this material was uh, was considered non-hazardous. So, and, and they were responsible for illnesses with this, so they had to write uh, something saying that, look, uh, this non-hazardous stuff can have, possibly be hazardous, and so forth. So uh, this is some of the parts of that, that, um, that study that, uh, that um, says that hazardous materials, non-hazardous materials can certainly be, be hazardous. So here's a, uh, a simple rule of thumb for identifying uniquely associated waste is where the waste came from downhole Otherwise, was generated in contact with the oil or gas production stream for the purpose of removing water or other contaminants from the well or the products. So basically, anything that's a result of exploration and production of petroleum products is not hazardous by definition. Now, where does that become a um, uh, where does that become a, um, a problem? Well, Thad Allen, who is the admiral who is in charge of the um, uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill cleanup aspect, uh, was asked in an interview whether, what, what chemicals were used, what antifreezes were used in the, um, in the oil spill. Let me explain to you why they use antifreezes. Antifreeze is necessary when you're dealing down 5,000 feet. It's from the, the water is below 32 degrees down there. And the hydrates, the water that comes up with the, with the methane gas and oil and so forth, freezes and blocks the rise of the risers of the pipe that comes from the bottom of the Gulf into the ships that are storing the oil. Well, what they use in these things is methanol, which is wood alcohol, uh, and uh, um, the wood alcohol, uh, 10 cc's will blind you, 30 cc's will kill you, okay? They also use um, uh, ethylene glycol, which is a regular antifreeze, and then you do had problems with your neighbor's dogs, may have heard somebody putting a little antifreeze on the, on the, on the wing and putting it out there, and the dogs die pretty quickly from it. We don't do that back home, but we've all heard of it. So these are extremely, extremely uh, 
powerful chemicals. And what's happened with this was that during the spill, um, here we go, I'm gonna date on that. Okay. Um, during the spill, they were using Corex. Some of you may have recalled seeing the uh, pictures of the oil coming out of the pipe at the bottom of the, of the Gulf and it's spewing into one of those five million gar barrels that were spilled. And when it came out, they were putting ethylene glycol in it, millions of gallons of it. They were putting methanol in it, millions of gallons in it. And I think they used two million dollars, two million dollars, two million barrels, I mean uh, gallons of Corex which is this toxic dispersant that they used. And all of this stuff flew into the surface, and when it got to the surface, what happened to it? They burned it, okay? And so you had ethylene glycol, methanol, Louisiana light crude, which is highly toxic in and of itself, and they had the, um, um, these other, um, uh, and then you had the core exit, and then you burned it, and God only knows what it created past that point. But uh, all of those materials were burned. I think I've got some pictures of this also in here. And this is a book that put out by BP. And, and uh, the comments were made by a couple of people that uh, none of the workers wore masks. And somebody said, Ricky Ott said that they didn't allow them to use masks in Alaska. Every person I talked to and understand that my patients were people that worked on the boats that cleaned up the spills and so forth. Every person I talked to was told that if they were caught wearing masks, they would be fired, and if anyone on the boat was caught wearing a mask, the boats would be fired also from the jobs. Now, Nalco, which is the company that makes Corex, okay, this dispersant that was used primarily out there, Nalco has a brochure that they put out before the spill that says you should wear respirators when you're dealing with these things. One of, one of the workers got hold of it, and. and, and let this get out. But Nalco has these things and it's in their own brochure, it's in their own material. And yet that was the case. This is a uh, all spill emergency response booklet put out by, uh, by BP itself. And uh, it talks about uh, routes of, uh, of absorption of this material. Uh, and it talks about Louisiana light crude. And by the way, you can fingerprint and do DNA or, or do DNA, whatever similar comment you want to make with it. Um, you can take oil from anywhere in the Gulf that's come up to the surface and you can tell where it came from because it's fairly specific in its content to the sites of its, its origin. And um, Louisiana light crude uh, inhalation may be fatal, may be fatal if inhaled and can cause a whole bunch of other symptoms and so forth and so on. And known to cause cancer. So this is, the, this is when they burned the material when it got to the surface. What they did was they surrounded the oil with these large booms, and then they had what was called a burn boat that went in, threw a Molotov cocktail type of material in there, and burned it, and then where this stuff went was wherever the wind brought it. And it could have been 100 miles or hundreds of miles away from the surface. During the course of the uh, spill, I received a call from a man, and he said, look, you need to read my book. He said, the symptoms that your patients are having are identical to the symptoms that people had from the 91 Gulf War, uh, the, from the Gulf War, the 91 Gulf War. And uh, we had about between 175,000 and 200,000 troopers come back. One out of every four troopers came back with what was known as Gulf War illness or Gulf War syndrome. The symptoms that they had were absolutely identical to the symptoms that my patients had with BP syndrome, identical symptoms. And at first I thought, well, this was from the oil that they burned in Kuwait. It had absolutely nothing to do with this. It had to do with certain other chemicals that we would use that were related chemically to the organophosphates poisons that we were afraid of during the Gulf War, sarin. These organophosphate poisons, and they're the same class of poisons that were used in the industrial strength insecticides that the patient that the soldiers put on their clothing, left on their clothing for weeks on end, keep the gnats and flies off them and so forth. And it was also uh, chemically related to um, one of the pills that they were given to prevent uh, problems from the gas exposures, okay? And it happens to be the same type of material as the gas itself. The theory being 
And if we give this pill to them, this pill is reversible, whereas the gas is not reversible. And it's a medicine that is used clinically to treat a condition called myasthenia gravis. But they never encountered a problem with it because they were treating just sick people with it and never and, and thinking that they could use it on, on healthy people. And it turned out that that wasn't the case. So why did only one out of every four persons get sick? Why did some people in Mayflower get sick and others not get sick at all? We know that there's some enzymes that some of us possess that others of us do not possess. And these enzymes are enzymes that allow your body to break down these chemicals much more readily than otherwise. And so people that have adequate amounts of these enzymes, one of the enzymes that they cited was PON1 or peroxidase. Not that that means anything to you or to me. Uh, but it's just that these things are present in some people. And that, uh, that gives us an answer to this. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that from my standpoint and from treating a couple of hundred people with this, I really don't give a rat's rear end about the studies that are done, okay? I'm a clinician, I'm a guy that treats people and so forth. So having drawn about 100 uh, uh, people's blood with, uh, for volatile organic compounds, I did not discuss the test results with a single one. I sent them to doctors that were more familiar with this and people that were more familiar with it. Because I've never claimed to be a toxicologist or anything else. I'm a clinician, I'm a, I treat people, I assess them as best I can clinically, and so forth. What we learned from the Vietnam, I mean, from the um, uh, Gulf War uh, experience was that the illnesses that these people suffered from, that these soldiers suffered from, and by the way, they came back and were considered malingerers, malcontents, and so forth, and they have never been treated for their illnesses. They have never been treated, and they have just recently been recognized as actually having illnesses. So we. These people came back and we patted ourselves on the back. We said what great heroes they were. They were so much nicer than when they came back from Vietnam and they were spat on and so forth and so on. Well, we did even worse to those people than we did to the kids from Vietnam. Although the Vietnam uh, era had something very similar, and that was Agent Orange uh, contamination and so forth, which we ignored. And we said the same thing about them when they initially got home. So, uh, There's a 2008, uh, the Gulf War was in 91, in 2008 a Senate committee came up with a report on Gulf War illness. And we can call that BP syndrome. We can call that Mayflower syndrome, okay? You guys are having the same type of symptoms at all. And uh, it was a blistering article and it explained a lot of what I, I subsequently learned from this. And um, uh, we're gonna go over these symptoms that they complained of with this. In just a minute. But uh, Gulf War syndrome had, um, had th this list of problems. But when I compared uh, uh, Gulf War syndrome to BP syndrome, this is what I came up with, okay? Uh, the, the blue would be the, uh, the BP syndrome, the Gulf War syndrome would be the left. And you can see that they're almost identical symptoms. And this came, my, my study came out of 150. 